Today, we're going to talk about something in this fireside chat about what it means to be like Jesus. What does it mean to be like Jesus? There are many, many areas that we can cover. And uh, we are, of course, not just talking about uh, doing signs and wonders, although that's inclusive. But we are also talking about our character and all that we are. We always say, sing that song, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like Jesus. And everyone, I believe, every Christian wants to be like Jesus. And every Christian aspires to be like Jesus. And we, we love examples of people who are like Jesus. And so there's a deep desire for all to conform to Jesus, which is actually the end of all our predestination. You know, you know, a lot of us, <coughs> we desire uh, different, different things in our life. We are concerned about our predestination. We are concerned about fulfilling God's perfect will. We are concerned about operating the gifts God has for us. We are concerned about finishing the work that God has upon our life. We are concerned about uh, making sure that when we meet Jesus face to face at the judgment seat, that He is pleased with us. He is happy about uh, us walking in His perfect will and receiving the best reward for all that we do in this life. That's excellent. But the most important part of being like Jesus and fulfilling God's perfect will and fulfilling the predestination of God is actually to be like Jesus. See, in the book of um, Romans chapter 8, Ultimately, all our different paths of predestination will end up in this general calling that Paul talks about to each one of us, where he says here in verse 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. So there we have it, that it's God's perfect will for us to become like Jesus. Though we all may have different paths, some of us are apostles, prophets, and some of us are business people, some of us are professional in different areas, some of us are intercessors, and some of us are ministry helps, administration, uh, evangelists, or whatever calling, whatever things that God has placed into your life to fulfill that aspect of predestination. Ultimately, His chosen destiny in our life is to be like Jesus. So no matter which path we take and what we fulfill and what we do in this life, at the end of the day, we are chosen and predestined to be conformed to His image. That's the ultimate. Considering that it is the ultimate destiny, for each one also to be like Jesus, we ask the question, what does it mean to be like Jesus? And there are several points. So we'll start with one of the first areas in this fatherly talk or this uh, fire chat site. Fatherly talk is written by this fire set chat. And that is be able to feel all that Jesus feels. Is this possible? Yes. In the book of uh, Philippians, chapter 1, Paul speaks to the Philippian Christian about his desire and his love for them. 
But it's not just what he felt for them. But it's what he felt for them through being linked to the feelings of Jesus Christ. To be like Jesus is simply to have the mind of Jesus, to have the feelings of Jesus, to do the will of Jesus, and to express Jesus who lives in us through our lives, through our words, thoughts, actions, everything that we do. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul makes this statement and says to them, uh, read from verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So Paul here talks about how deeply he fell for the, for the Philippines. And we know how the Philippian church started in Acts chapter 16. Paul was actually led there by a vision of the Macedonian man. And when he went there, he found a group of ladies uh, selling purple, uh, what, uh, this, this leader selling purple and group of ladies uh, at the riverside praying. And his first witness of Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, was to these ladies. And so he bear witness about Jesus, he must have converted them and then uh, brought knowledge to them. And then he was in a marketplace preaching the gospel. And there was a little girl possessed by evil spirit who keeps saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. And every day that little girl followed Paul and uh, his companions until one day Paul reached a point where he felt that this was enough and he turned around and commanded the evil spirit to get out of the girl. Uh, evil spirit left and of course the fortune tellers couldn't use the little girl anymore. And uh, then Paul got into the prison. And in prison, uh, he and Silas who was also in prison with him began to sing psalms and hymns and uh, worship the Lord at about midnight there was a supernatural earthquake all the chains fell, no prisoner escaped and the jailer was going to kill himself because he don't kill himself he will be killed and sentenced to death anyway if everyone escapes and the Paul says you know, uh, you know hold, hold your peace or stop don't do that because we are all still here imagine the prison gates were open the chains were, were, were broken they could easily walk out of prison and nobody walk out of the prison and uh, so the jailer took them home and um, uh, entertained them with great hospitality washed their wounds and they had a comfortable thing and um, then they re when, when uh, the next day when they put Paul on trial they realized that he was a Roman citizen and they were afraid because you cannot do things as a Roman citizen without a proper trial and so Paul said they're not going to go out of prison unless the uh, leaders of the city escort us out because they shame us by imprisoning us and so they, they got the escort out and Paul continued preaching the Philippine church became a very very strong church and as you see in the, in the book of Philippians that they became a partners upon the ministry they were one of the many churches that constantly sent offerings to Paul supported him, partnered with his ministry wherever he went so Paul has a very deep uh, relationship with the Philippian church. They were his partners, they were his fellow prayers, intercessors, supporters, in every way, even though Antioch church also sent him out. And Paul had great deep uh, feelings for these people, great love for them, of course. And this love came from Jesus. Paul, for some reason, managed to tap upon the affection of Jesus. Now, isn't that wonderful? I know as humans, we all have love, we all have compassion, we all develop our sympathy, empathy, and uh, kindness of heart to people. 
but even greater is to be able to feel the heartbeat of Jesus and flow from the heartbeat of Jesus to be able to look at people in their eyes and know that it's Jesus looking at them through your eyes to be able to see every situation and feel every situation from the heart of Jesus so Paul says this that the feelings the affections the love that he had for them was technically in verse 8 he says the splatna the Greek word affection is splatna the splatna or the affection of Jesus Christ are you conscious of not your feelings but the heart and feeling and quote unquote the splatna of our Lord Jesus. Ah, what does it feel to have that splatna of the Lord Jesus? We talk about being like Jesus. If you could feel what Jesus feel, it helps to grow in the path of being like Jesus. Jesus literally felt the splatna. Uh, Paul literally felt the splunk now, Jesus. The exact feeling of what Jesus had for every human being. And every human being he met. Paul felt the affection of Jesus flowing out th through him to all the people around. And he wrote this. That this is not Paul. This is not human. This is the splatna or the affection of our Lord Jesus flowing through. Meditate on this. What? When the splatna of Jesus, which has to be a spiritual splatna, although it tied to the word, the entrails or the bowels in the old King James translation, something deep inside you coming forth. Let's establish this. I believe everyone who is born again has the ability to tap on this. And I believe that everyone born again can grow in this affection. And I believe that everyone who is in Jesus can have their personal feelings, their personal emotions, replaced by this platna or the emotions of Jesus Christ. It must be wonderful to be able to feel what Jesus feels. And Paul has that. So how does this platna flow through our lives? When you examine the word splatna here, which Paul said, I long for you with a splatna or the inward affection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This scripture, Spartan, has been translated in various forms. Like in Luke 178, it says, Through the tender mercy of our God. So it's, it, the word Spartan, it says, the, the, the Spartan of the mercy of God. So this Spartan is related to the mercy of God. And we are told in the Bible, Paul, of course, tells us that we need to have this affection and mercy. Notice even in Philippians 2 verse 1, the same chapter, uh, same Bible book, next chapter. He says, Therefore, in verse 1, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship or koinonia of the Spirit, if any splatna and mercy. Have you noticed again, this is the second time that the word splatna is related to mercy just like uh, Luke chapter 1 just now. Splatna and mercy are related. Splatna is an encapsulation of the mercy of God into our human psyche and soul. It's a spiritual emotion that flow into our physical emotion. That is a gift of God that God enables us to have. 
Besides that, even though they don't use the same expressions as Paul, Paul, uh, in, uh, not only Paul, but also um, he, he mentioned about how this platna can be refreshed and strengthened. It says uh, in to Philemon 1 verse 20, he says, and he wrote to him about Onesimus, he says, Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my splatna in the Lord. In Philemon 1.20. So this splatna can be refreshed as a group. And the more you give, the more you feel. The more you express it, the more it strengthens in your life. And it's been translated as the word heart, but in, in actual fact, it's the word Splatna, which is a totally different word. The word heart should be the word kadia, but here in Philemon 120 is the word splatna. And here's first John 3:17. In first John 3:17, it talks about how we can let that love from God flow through our lives continually. And John writes it in this way in verse 16 and 17 of First John 3. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his partner from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Oh, this is a powerful verse. It means that whenever the love of God wants to flow, it actually flow through this splatna, this inner working of God's mercy, compassion, and mercy and love through our lives. So John is saying, Everyone must love, we must walk in love, walking in love, walking in the light, those who don't walk in love, walk in darkness, and all these principles and theology of love is correct. But when it comes to where the rubber hits the road, where the practical application of it is, is that this love that is flowing so much to Jesus, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I mean, this love is like an ocean. Jesus loves us so much that though we were sinners, He died for us. And this love that needs to, to fill us, it's like we are in this ocean of God's love. Everywhere we are surrounded because of the grace of God we released in the New Testament. Jesus even says, a new commandment I gave to you. They should love one another. So this abundance of the release of the love of God. In the Old Testament, God was still God love. He revealed that He did everything that He did for the Israelites in Deuteronomy because of His love. He says that it's not because you're more righteous, it's not because you're greater, it's not because you're more powerful, but because I love you. That's why you can succeed. And in the New Testament, this love is revealed even more dramatically through the Jesus on the cross and resurrection. It's revealed in the scriptures and this abundance of the grace that we live. So it's like literally, literally we're surrounded by God's love. But it's almost like someone in the ocean and uh, it could be in a little boat in the ocean. And everywhere you go, north, south, east, west, you see the plain ocean. And you could say, like one of the poets, English poet, poets say, Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Yes, you're surrounded by this ocean of love all over you. But it's not flowing through you. Isn't that amazing? Now, if any one of you have lived a Christian life long enough, you know, God bless those of you who just come to know the Lord and you 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 just uh, born again, you probably think that the church is, uh, is the fullness or the personification of our Lord Jesus Christ in a thousand ways. And that's before you encounter Christians who don't walk like Christians, leaders who don't follow Jesus fully, and so much uh, imperfection in the church, and you realize, okay, where is Jesus in all this? And... It is a true situation of the church in its present state, waiting for perfection. In the end, 
we don't want to wait until somebody else change. We don't wait until there's a, a new church that is more loving or more like Jesus. We don't wait for some leader somewhere. We don't wait for some Christian somewhere. Let's start with our own lives. Let's, let's learn how to tap on that love of God. And that love is tapped by a spiritual organ within us called the splatna. S-P-L-A-G-N-A Romanize The Splagna And this Splagna Works within us But we still have a free choice Which First John describes In verse 17 When you see someone in need When you see someone who's sad When you see someone who's broken Every human Will feel something Right? When you see someone who is suffering, when you see someone so poor that they don't have enough food to eat, when you see someone without shelter, when you see someone who is sick, when you see someone who is destitute, weak or bullied, something in you feel compassion, mercy. And not all of us have the power to do something about that. But what John is saying, if you have the ability, and he's not talking about spiritual ability alone, he's talking about natural ability to help a person. If you felt something, there's something that wants to love a person, want to, want to help the person, want to lift up the person, then that is a spark now working. There's the love and the mercy of God working. And then John says, if you don't yield to it, you don't let it flow through you to do something, you have just shut the love of God from your life. For you, the poem runs true. Love, love everywhere, but not a drop that flows through your life. The love of God flows through our life when we are more sensitive to the splatna of Jesus, the affection of Jesus flowing through us. That's why many times, I know people always tell me, don't, don't, don't help the beggar, don't this and that. But sometimes, Sometimes, I know, sometimes a syndicate and all that. But there may be true ones here and there. Sometimes I see somebody don't have food, you know, but uh, two times already at least. Uh, I was at a hawker center. And then after uh, it, the food, there's a bit left over. I didn't quite like the taste. Imagine, then when I saw someone come and eat, want to eat my food, that is a leftover. I say, oh, cannot. How can I let this man do that? And so I was moved to give money to the person to buy his own food. And um, or sometimes you see a beggar, and then you know uh, there were several times when I was in uh, Istanbul, and you know in Turkey there's a group of migrants from Syria. A lot of them were really really poor. The last time some of us been to Izmir, not not this recent trip in February, but a year before that was when the Syrian refugee crisis took place and the war was very new and you some of you were in Izmir you would notice a lot of people on the streets and uh, they, they're not there now I don't know where they go they must have been helped by other people some of these are very genuine they lost their homes some of them have lost family members who were killed in the war and some of them they go there they got no work and because they, are, they could be illegal they're just refugees and uh, they don't have a shelter there and you know how cold it can get and um, so uh, on this recent trip every time I walk past a certain place in Istanbul I see this lady uh, and with a child and uh, of course in the street I discern that that she was a refugee and so every time I walk by I say and it was a cold night and, you know recently it was cold and I said, I'm going back to the hotel room where I got a warm bed, I have a warm shower, 
I got good food and um, but here's this lady and and I don't know where she's gonna sleep and how long she was sitting down there waiting for some pity or some some people who give her a few dollars a few turkey dollars so she can have some food and whether she syndicate or not you know to me I can never walk by her without giving her something so almost every day you know I would give something and um, then one day I was walking by I think it was the third day or so I forgot and and she was with another lady and a child and they were eating and I look at her I say I just had a I forgot whether I just had a good dinner or so no we did a good dinner I say oh my this is the food she eat compared to the food I just ate. Say no, uh, you know, I, I, I want to you know, look for more, some, some more things for her. This is compassion. This is love flowing. And it's not much. I mean, you know how turkey money is not that big. And um, so, so every time I give her something, I could feel the angels singing. I could almost hear you know, the, a melody here. And you know how, if you're sensitive, you can hear heaven's music. You could hear almost ta 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 kind of thing. And, um, and I also have been to the spiritual world. You know, I was taken out for about six weeks and I've been to heaven. And God showed me that sometimes a small act of kindness can have a ripple effect through many lives. Uh, it's like when you, you know how when you stir water, you see the wave in the circle flow out. It's a ripple through the water. So depend on how big the stirring is. You stir very big, you see the waves go in a bigger way. And God showed me from heaven that every small act, every small thought, every kind word, uh, every little amount of help you give, to anyone, whether spiritual or in a soul, you encourage someone or you give someone a bit of money to help them. Any act that comes from love and kindness, it has a ripple effect. And sometimes it ripples through several layers and sometimes it gets bigger and bigger because you know we're all touched by love, right? If somebody showed their love to you in a very moving way, sacrificial way, just as Jesus showed love to us, it ripples through us. Why do we all accept Jesus? Let me ask you. I'm sure it's not just because there's a ticket to heaven. Then you just accept Jesus because of fear. We accept Jesus because we see Him love us before we love Him. It is the love that moves us. His love transforms and changes. This love we know can even change hardened criminals and turn them into evangelists. This love that Jesus had can change a woman at the well who lived with five husbands. she gone through five divorces. And then the one she's living with in sin is not even marriage. She must have given up on marriage. And when Jesus talked to her, she erased stunned by many things. Number one, the prejudice between the Samaritans and the Jews was so great that most Jews were not even bothered to talk to another Samaritan, let alone a woman whom people perceived to be a prostitute or a sinner. But Jesus don't care about that. Secondly, they wouldn't even want her to have help from the Samaritan woman, but Jesus asked her for water. Thirdly, Jesus loved her and reached out to her and did not crucify her for her sins. Tell you, this woman was touched within that one hour or two that Jesus spoke to her. And she immediately began to want to talk about God and spiritual things. Then, when Jesus talked about the Messiah and who He is, she wanted to believe in Him. Because somewhere, someplace, His love came out 
through his words. You know, sometimes you don't have to tell a person you love them. They can feel whether you love them. Whatever Jesus did, in that one hour to two or three hours, while his disciples went to buy lunch, the woman felt she was forgiven. She was loved. She was accepted. She was taught. She was given a new revelation. What happened to the women? She confessed her sin. She tell people, you know, I met a man who could tell me all my past and, and, he, and, he, and he forgave me. She became an evangelist for Jesus throughout the whole town. She tell everyone about Jesus. Because Jesus had love. If you have love, people will know it. If you don't have love, people also know it. It is not your powerful gifts that change people. It is the love that you use with the powerful gifts that will be effective on this world. An apostle with love is better to, than an apostle without love. A prophet with love will go further than a prophet without love. A teacher with love is better than a condemning teacher. Everything with love is so different. Take away love and the whole world crumbles. Take away love from every family, every marriage, and the world will crumble. And if families crumble, governments will crumble. The currency of heaven is love. The oxygen of heaven is love. And if you are part of the Church of Jesus Christ, understand that no matter how great your gifting, how powerful your gifting, how high your calling, without love, it is zero effectiveness. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have no love, I am just, I paraphrase it, you will be just like a noisy, clanging cymbal. Only noise comes up. Verse 2, Corinthians 13, first. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have no love, I am nothing. You could be the best prophet of 7 billion people, top notch in your accuracy and gift, but if people cannot sense love in you, in your words and in your prophecy, you could might as well be a rock somewhere hidden under Antarctica, cold and desolate, and no one want to live on top of the place where you are. You could have faith to move every mountain, create astounding miracles. You might have even followers. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. And it is possible that people are charitable to make a name for themselves. So Paul says, you can give all that you have to the poor, feed them. You can even give your body to be burned. But at the end of the day, if you don't have love, it profits nothing. Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, after he identified the need for love, he says, Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts, especially 
that you may prophesy. Let's not forget that the foundation of the whole New Testament is love. Jesus quantified as a commandment of love to us. He says, by this, you will know, people will know you are my disciples. Today, the world is filled with false prophets, apostate churches, half-hearted Christians, deceptive leaders, sinful evangelists greedy and covetous televangelists. How do we know whether that person, that man of God, that woman of God, that church that we attend is true, uh, is led by a true believer in Jesus or not? You know how? The love of God. But it's not just saying, I have the love, I have the love, and then you can claim. Does your life demonstrate love? And it has to be action love. You show through your life. Sacrificial love. And this love, and it has to be a genuine love to weak or strong, rich or poor, young or old, black or white, every culture, then your love is the love of Jesus. It cannot be a conditional love. By that kind of love, will we be transformed to be more like Jesus in our life? That is the true spark now. That is what is important, to be like Jesus. The spark now has to flow through our life. And John says in 1 John 3.17, if you cannot even respond to the people in front of you, you know we all like ideal situations. If you live long enough in this world, let me tell you, there's no such thing as an ideal situation. You can plan all you want. You can, you can logistically arrange, organize all you want. The test is when is not an ideal situation. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? After Jesus said, the two greatest commandments, love God, love my neighbor. They got no problem with loving God. But they have a problem with loving their neighbor. And John himself says, if you cannot love people whom you can see. How can you love God whom you cannot see? And that is why I do my best to practice the love of God. So sometimes to strangers or to people, when I look at them, I always don't want to look at them through my eyes. Whether it be a taxi driver, a delivery boy, food, or whether it be a supermarket person or stranger on the street, a poor person or a beggar. Every time I see, you know, and even that, uh, that it moved to everybody. But it might start with areas where you can easily have compassion. I always look and say, how does Jesus feel about this person? What is Jesus feeling now? I like, I like to feel what Jesus feels for this person. And then from that feeling and splatna, do what you think Jesus would do. And when you keep doing it constantly, then your true love will grow. Your love will become like a river and an ocean where you, lead, you, you love unconditionally. You, you, you care for people unconditionally. Sometimes one act of love I saw in heaven change a person forever. It changed the re receiver of the love and it changed the person who gave out that love. And sometimes things are connected in ways we do not know. Like for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God says to the Israelites when they form a nation, 
if you sin and disobey me, your, the heaven will be brass and there will be no rain. That means implied famine will come. Now isn't it very odd to connect the righteousness of a country, which is a social, moral thing, with weather patterns? Scientifically, there's no connection. But spiritually, there's connection. Because the energy of the people is like water vapor. If it's a righteousness and holiness release, it's a water vapor that God used to create the clouds that rain blessing on them. But this is invisible. People cannot see that. In the same way, you might not see the connection to a beggar that you help, or maybe to a brother who lost a job and you help them for one year. Of course, you are not obligated to help beyond what you're able. You don't have to get the debt to help someone else, which some weird preacher keeps thinks is, is right. You help according to your ability. You would never know that the brother or the sister you help who went through a rough patch and they just need help for a year, then later they got a job, they're successful, they go on. You never would connect that, that help that you gave for the one year. Five years later, three years later, ten years later, the Lord do something in your life, something marvelous. Maybe you inherit a gold mine, <laughs> hundreds of millions of bars of gold, and you thank God for that. It sees the grace of God. But when you go to heaven and you check the books, you will you find that the gold mine given to you was connected to the one year you helped that brother. See, the blessings of God doesn't come from the same channel which you pour out. God has unlimited ways to bring that blessing to you. And I saw it in the spiritual realm. I saw every act, every help, every love, every gesture of kindness. You reap what you sow. People think that sowing is just sowing money. You know, if you sow money without love, uh, it's just that like what Paul said, you can give everything of your body, but you got no profit. Behind everything you do must be the splatna and the love of God moving you. Then it's powerful. How do we become like Jesus? Many people want to become like Jesus and overnight, tap, tap, and then, you know, this sounds more like, uh, what's that, the monsters or whatever, <laughs> TV, and then they become like Jesus. Let me teach you a better way to become like Jesus. Start with the smallest thing. Learn to feel kindness to strangers. Learn to see beyond the social mask that people wear. Don't see people just as a robot serving and doing something. Behind every human being serving is a story. It could be a mother, a brother, a sister, a wife, or family member. Behind everything that humans do is a human being. And each human being has a story. A story in which they have to walk the walk of faith, sacrifice things, educate themselves, or pull themselves in society. Because everyone has to do something to bring themselves out. It's a fallen world. And in a fallen world, if you do nothing, you will be swept away. So you have to rise through every challenge, through walking in love and righteousness to progress forth. If you really want to be like Jesus, don't wait until... But right now, in any small way that the prompting. You see, how does Plakna work? Little prompting. The little promptings are so soft that if you don't pay attention, you don't know that it's there. Like, like John says, this prompting to help this brother in need, if you don't yield, the love of God cannot flow through you. In small, small ways, Jesus is teaching us to be like him. Don't wait until you have an opportunity to preach and share to 10,000 people, then you try to be like Jesus. No, you can be like Jesus one to one. 
You can be like Jesus when nobody knows who you are. But you know why? None of you are living in a cave, I presume. And if any one of you right now listening to sermon, you're in a cave, please get out and socialize and learn how to love. <laughs> you're not living, you know, on a lonely island. Wherever you are, you have a neighbor. And the Pharisee asks, who is my neighbor? Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Your neighbor is someone you didn't plan, not necessarily someone who li lives next door to you physically, although that includes that. Your neighbor is the people that come across your life who need help, who need a touch of love, who need a kind smile, a kind word. Your neighbor, all the people you encounter around you, that's where you can do the little things to become more like Jesus. Becoming like Jesus is not pray, 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 pray. You root to everyone. You pray, 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 fast, 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 fast. You go to the highest revelation and you talk about things so heavenly beyond the concept of everyone. Or you pray, 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 pray. You got sudden vision, sudden gaze, sudden prophecy to predict what will happen in every country from week to week. Or, you know, this is our prophecy. You have all these prophecies, all this understanding, mystery. You have no love what the Bible says. It's all nothing. All your ability to move mountains. Hey, that's a big thing, you know. How many people move mountains? You come on, go from here to there and the mountain move. And that's the way you want to become like Jesus? No. Your neighbor is right where you are. And sometimes it's a situation you never plan. You think the priest walking past the man who was injured, plan to walk by that man. No, he doesn't even know such a thing is going to happen because the robbers robbed that man. You know what the priest did? He walked, walked, walked and he crossed the other side of the road and ignored the poor man who was dying. And then the second man came, look, and then walk away. And a man who by culture is the enemy and an opponent of the Jews saw that man wash his wound, carried him on his horse or camel or donkey, took him to an inn, asked that he be taken care of, left some money for the care of the man and then left. Who is the neighbor to the injured man? The Samaritan. Now, that Samaritan did not plan for that to happen. So don't think that you can plan love. The demands of love in your life will come through the chaos of life. And all you have to do is in every situation, you learn to listen to the splunkna in you. Small little acts of love, even if they are micrometers, through many, 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 many seconds and lifetime, change you until you become like Jesus. Just like the renewal of you process, you know, it is not like suddenly you got so much power, no, it didn't zzz, and you know, you look 100 years old, suddenly you become 21 years old. Now, it's the little, little changes in your heart and mind where you become a more positive person, thinking Bible thoughts, where your emotions are more filled with love, joy and peace rather than depression, sadness and grief. All the small, small microseconds of thoughts and feelings that you hold on to every day transform and renew your body. Your cells are being renewed every second. And these microseconds are what makes reality. In Malay, we have a little proverb. And it called is this Sedikit Sedikit Lama Lama Bajadi Bukit. It means a little bit at a time you can build it into a hill or a mountain. 
So it's the small little things that build you into Christ-likeness, that change your character, not the big things alone. Finally, let me read from Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 is a very important chapter because it's a chapter that teaches you how to enter into the rest. Part of the enter into the rest is this. It is learning to cease from your own works and let, because it says there in verse uh, 10, he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. You know what this rest is? This rest is learning to die to self and let Jesus flow through you. Now, there are many ways it flow through us, through the mind of Jesus, which we hope to touch on the next sermon. But today we have talked about having the feelings of Jesus, being like Jesus. Is to let Jesus flow out through you and not yourself, correct? If, if Jesus is in you, like Paul say, it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. That's Galatians 2.20. So if it's not you who live, but Christ living through you, that is the rest. And each time you let Jesus flow through you, I can assure you if Jesus flows through you in many, many ways, in small little things and in big things, you will enter into a life of just resting. Because every time Jesus is in you, wanting to do things and you yield to him, all through his three years with his disciples, the disciples always like to plan things logistically and everything. I think none of them would have talked to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. But Jesus was prompted to talk to her and be kind to her and change her life. One little conversation changed her entire life. When they brought little children to come to Jesus, who was the one reacting? The disciples. And then Jesus said, Don't stop the children from coming. Let them come. Can you see the love of Jesus contrasted with the high, high-handed planning and logistics of the apostles and disciples? All you have to do to enter the rest is tap on the splagna Jesus, the affection of Jesus. And every time that splatna and affection flow, you let it flow. And it becomes very easy. Your life is just giving out love, sharing love, a smile, a conversation, a prayer. You know, you got no money, you share encouragement, you got money, share a little bit here and there. And you keep flowing, doing little things, small little things like buying a meal for somebody in need. All these are kindness that flow. And like the Bible says, cast your bread on the water. After many days, it will come to you. And it's a life of restfulness. You don't have to plan anything. But you know how and what you should do in every situation. Let the love of Jesus flow. And do your best to flow with that splatna. That's all. But part of it, it says here, is to come to the throne of God. And it says, Seeing then in verse 14 that we have a great high priest who had passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hallelujah. I know some of you are saying, Hallelujah. Yes, Amen. We need the grace of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Please read carefully. It says, find grace, obtain mercy. Correct? Hey, read your Bible, please. Come to the throne of grace. And that's the throne where grace is dispensed we may obtain mercy and then find grace. Okay, let me read the Greek word for you. 
The word obtain is lambano, which means a simple word means to receive. I receive mercy. And then the word find grace. The word find is from the word hurisco. Hurisco grace. So the Greek says lambano mercy, hurisco grace. Lambano means I actually receive mercy. Then grace is you're already at the throne of grace. But yet he says, Hurisco grace, which means, to Hurisco means to find, to get, to obtain, to perceive, to see. 178 times it's been used. And 174 times it's used as the word to look for it, to find to come upon, to meet with, searching. Okay, let me ask you this question as we end. Why you come to the throne of grace, take to find grace? Isn't it right there in front of you? Okay, this is how grace works. When you go to the throne of grace, you actually receive mercy. And that mercy, as I read to you, is tied to splagna. Because plakna and mercy are the same force. One is the force that comes on the throne. But plakna is the affection of Jesus. Because Jesus is the living personification of mercy. So that, that plakna is the same force beating in your heart with the affection of Jesus. So what happens? When you come to the throne of grace, you actually receive an impartation of mercy into your splatna. You receive a greater ability to empathize to f and to have compassion and to, and to, and to have sympathize, empathize and have love and compassion for people. That means that you feel the love of God in a greater manner. Now, next, it is up to you. Being able to feel that, that, that mercy through your splatna and affection of Jesus, each time you release that splatna, like what 1 John 3, 17 says, you release it. Each time you release it, grace is found. Hallelujah. Can you see the connection now? Why do some people not have enough grace? Because I'm not sure I can use this strong word, better not, you know. Uh, because they're just stingy in their love. They got no grace. But the more you're generous with the affection and the love and the empathy and sympathy of Jesus, grace abounds in your life. And when grace abounds, you know, grace brings things as spiritual, natural, spirit, and, 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 and so in every way. When grace flows like a river in your life, that's like the Obed-Edom effect all over you. So today, in this series that we call Being Like Jesus, we talk about having the splat now of Jesus. And it's important. First, our first point, was Plakna and mercy are related. They are both the manifestation of mercy. One from God, the other in your heart, in the affection of Jesus. Number two, it is like a fountain and a river that flows in small little ways. You know, some people are looking for the Niagara Falls. But even the Niagara Falls start as a small little stream higher up. Even the great Amazon River starts from a tiny little place of water flowing down. Sometimes rivers start from snow melting a little at a time. Little drops of snow melting. But as they gather in time, in space, in geography, in distance, they became a powerful, gigantic river and waterfall. So the second point is, let it flow in small little steps. 
thirdly, the mystery between grace, mercy is at the throne of grace. The missing part is splatna. You obtain mercy in your splatna that gives you a capacity to do works of love because without love, nothing works. In between point two and three, I talk about how important love is. It's the oxygen and the currency of heaven and of this life. And that point of the mystery of mercy and grace. How you can increase grace in your life is through releasing the love of God in your life. As you release a spagna, grace abounds in your life. May the grace of God increase and bless your life. Have a wonderful Sunday and I pray that you grow in the fullness of the mercy and the grace of God through flowing in the promptings of the splatna in your heart, the affection of Jesus. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Feel the emotions of Jesus. Feel the heart of Jesus. Then you'll be like Jesus. The Lord bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.